Uh, cool. Nga mihi nui kia koutou, ko Cheryl Doig toko ingoa, uh, no of te tahi ahau. I'm one of the trustees of Akawo Te Tahi, Learning City Christchurch, which is a charitable trust uh, here in, in Christchurch, and I'm also the host of today's conversation. Um, I'm just going to share a, a couple of slides, first of all, just to give you a little bit of a, a background about Learning uh, City and the, the work that we do. Um, just bear with me while I... Uh, to that. Okay. So our session today, the difference an individual can make with uh, Anna Button from Hagar, New Zealand. Uh, it's great to have you here, Anna. Um, just a little bit about Akawata Tahi. Our aim is to uh, provide a, a coordinated, equitable and future ready city where everyone uh, has access to learning and um, of course that can't be achieved alone. It requires a movement for change where learning is valued in its many, many forms and so um, for us we're committed to trying to support people to have the opportunities uh, that lead to successful learning. So we have three focuses. One is, is um, focused on equity on access and on innovation. Um, we're committed to creating opportunities for everyone and uh, we support this by engaging with leaders and champions of change, amplifying opportunities and innovations, advocating for equity and connecting people, ideas and local change movements. So thank you for joining us today and for helping us to grow the learning ecosystem. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Anna. Uh, Anna's the Communications and Pro Programs Manager at Hagar New Zealand and um, she'll be sharing uh, a little bit about the work of Hagar um, and some examples of, of who's working in the space and also bringing it back to the, the place of Christchurch in New Zealand and what we can all do to make a difference. So um, I'm going to just stop my sharing and come back to um, the, the space. So um, Anna's uh, the, Anna uh, is with us here in Christchurch and she has a long involvement in serving NGOs in her community from working with World Vision to being part of her local community uh, council board. She's currently the communications and programs manager at Hagar New Zealand. Hagar is an international organization dedicated to the recovery of women and children who have endured extreme abuses, working to see communities free and healed from trauma of human slavery, trafficking, trafficking and abuse. I think this is going to be a really, really important conversation. Um, so there may be a chance to ask, ask some questions at the end of the presentation, but right now I'm going to hand over to you, Greta, to share your screen. Uh, sorry, not Greta, uh, Anna, to share your screen and um, tell us a little bit more about the important work that Hagar does. Well, thank you very much, Cheryl, and uh, welcome to you, ladies, and thank you very much for joining um, on this Christchurch afternoon. Uh, so, yeah, I guess as Cheryl has kind of alluded to, um, the topic that I'm about to delve into is one that is global in its nature, uh, but also very intense in its nature. And I recognize it's going to be quite a different topic to um, some of the others that are on offer during Learning Week. Uh, so essentially what I'm going to do is just launch into uh, the presentation that I've prepared. And I hope that you glean real value from it and that you all walk away learning something. Um, which is really what my heart is, uh, but also there will be an opportunity for questions and answers, hopefully at the end, if I manage to power through this big topic in good time. Uh, so I thought that I would start today by sharing a story with you all. Uh, and the story is of a woman called um, Hoa, um, who grew up in Vietnam. And when she was in her, her late teens, um, her dad was in a really bad motorcycle accident um, and suffered quite significant physical injuries as a result of that motorcycle accident. And around the same time, her mum actually, actually also got cancer. 
And so with both parents unable to work, it fell to Hawa to, to leave school and to go and find employment to be able to earn money uh, to provide and support her family. Um, which is not an uncommon circumstance in the developing world. And Hoa Fair um, found a job at a restaurant um, as a waitress. And as time went on, uh, she became friends at the restaurant with an older woman. Uh, and um, as their friendship developed um, over time, um, Hoa thought that the friendship was so strong and deep that she actually called the older woman who was her friend's sister, right? So Hoa thought that this was a really quite significant relationship to her. And you can imagine in Hoa's circumstance with everything that's going on around at home, um, how valuable that friendship would have seemed to her. And as time went on, this older woman um, said to Hoa, hey, look, uh, I know someone who um, can offer you a job at a nail studio in Singapore, um, and I can help get you over to Singapore, and you'll be able to go and work there and earn heaps of money to send back to your family in Vietnam. Now, you can probably imagine, again, uh, what an exciting opportunity this seemed like for, for Hoa. And so she willingly went. Um, but unfortunately, instead of ending up in Singapore working for um, a nail art studio, she ended up working, arriving in Malaysia and working in a brothel. Um, and the woman that she had befriended in the restaurant was actually involved in human trafficking. And Hoa essentially ended up in, in a foreign country uh, with no idea what the language was, um, working in this brothel where she was um, forced to serve uh, between 10 to 15 men a day um, and her um, brothel owner essentially worked her um, for desperate want of a better word um, until she actually physically could no longer do it anymore and then he cast her out onto the streets of Malaysia um, and so you can imagine the state that she was in where she had not only survived the trauma of actually being trafficked and being um, forced to work in sexual slavery uh, but she was almost almost dead in a foreign country with no idea how she was going to get home. Um, and unfortunately, the story um, of Hoa is not is not rare. It's not uncommon. Um, she's actually a single illustration of a global issue um, that exists in prevalent nature um, in our world today. Um, and that is. Ooh. Hang on a second, we're having trouble. Oh, there you go, plugging the slides. Uh, so essentially, um, Hoa was an example both of um, human trafficking. So the practice of being um, tricked and deceived um, and moved for the purposes of exploitation. Um, and human trafficking is actually the fastest growing criminal industry in the world today. Um, it is already um, the second largest um, second only to drugs, um, the buying and selling of drugs and the buying and selling of weapons. Um, the buying and selling and moving of humans is the third. I think I said the second, it's the third, my correction. Uh, but it's the fastest growing. Um, and the reason that it's the fastest growing is as Hoa's circumstance illustrates, is that while you can only profit from the buying and the selling of drugs or weapons once, um, if you are involved in trafficking and you own Hoa, for example, and you're selling her for 10 to 15 times a day, um, that's an ongoing revenue source. And so we are, we're seeing, um, we're living in a world right now uh, where the buying and the selling and the exploiting of humans is the fastest growing criminal industry in the world. And it's estimated to be worth about 150 billion US dollars every year um, for those that are involved in it. So it is exceptionally lucrative and financially rewarding for those who don't have um, a conscious or any kind of qualms about being involved in this kind of trade. Um, and one of the um, consequences of this growing um, criminal industry and of this buying and selling of humans um, is that we also live in a world today um, where 40.3 million people are living in some kind of slavery, uh, waking up in the morning with no say over what happens in their day, who they're working for, um, or any control over their own lives, essentially, much like Hoa was. Um, in her brothel situation. Uh, so I emphasize not all of the 40.3 million people have been trafficked, um, but millions of them have been. Um, some people who make up that number of 40.3 million, um, for example, have been, are in state imposed forced labor, um, or they might be um, in a forced marriage 
um, so they've entered a marriage where they've had no um, choice or say over their marriage partner. Um, and that's considered in slavery as well. But 40.3 million people, um, folks, um, and that is more people um, than ever before in human history um, are in forced servitude. Uh, about 25% of them, estimates show, again, I, I, I'm going to say estimates a lot because it's important to me that you know that these are just estimates. We'll never even know the full number, um, obviously. Um, but estimates would indicate that about 25% of them are children, people under the age of 18 uh, in some kind of forced exploitation. Um, and 29 million of them um, are women and children. So it's an issue that this appropriately affects uh, women and children. But the other um, issue I want, the fact I wanted to draw your attention to today is that of that 40.3 million, 61% um, are living in the Asia Pacific region. Um, so just a couple of hours away from here. Um, this is not an issue that is far, far away in Africa, though it does exist in Africa. Um, it is an issue that um, when we could hop back on planes and, um, and travel freely, um, is actually something that is happening very close to our shores in New Zealand. And I'll get a little, um, uh, get into how our buying decisions and our choices here in Christchurch actually influence that fact a bit later on. Um, so I guess the sustainable development goal that I really got asked to kind of share into and why I'm here today is around number five, sustainable development goal number five, uh, which really is about achieving gender equality and the empowerment of for all women and girls. Uh, and specifically, um, the issue that I'm talking about this morning is very much tied to um, the sub goals of 5.2 and 5.3, which are talking about um, eliminating all forms of violence against all women and girls in the public and private spheres, including trafficking and sexual and other types of exploitation. So just like Hawa, right? Um, that goal speaks directly to, to her and um, the millions of other women like her or who are in those circumstances right now. But also uh, 5.3, which is eliminating all harmful practices such as child, early and forced marriage. Um, and female genital mutilation. Um, so 15, so of that 40.3 million, if you just remember back to the slide beforehand, um, of that 40.3 million, about 15.4 million of them are, are women and children in, in forced marriages. Um, yes. So that is the issue in a real nutshell. <laughs> and one illustra and one story. Um, of one woman who has been impacted by that global issue. Um, and changing tacks a little bit now because uh, the title of this conversation is very much, you know, the difference that one individual can make. And so to bridge into that kind of topic, I wanted to introduce this guy. Um, I don't know if any of you will recognize um, him from that image, uh, but this is William Wilberforce, um, who is a well-known uh, global, global, no, British, parliamentarian, what am I saying? Um, but well known for his role in eradicating um, the practice of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, but also freeing those um, within Britain and the British Empire who had been um, in slavery. Um, and William essentially spent his entire life um, advocating for those in slavery um, overcoming every single challenge that was presented to him um, by his fellow parliamentarians, um, taking a massive hit physically um, in terms of his own health and well-being. Uh, but the call of his life was very much uh, to advocate for those in slavery and to do all that he could to set them free. Uh, but the unfortunate reality is, is that, and I sometimes wonder personally, what he would think of our world right now, um, because a lot of people think that the practice of slavery ended uh, when he abolished it. Uh, but the reality of the circumstances that there are more people in slavery right now than at any other time um, in our history, including when William Wilberforce was advocating to get rid of the practice. And I think that that's something significant that we should all uh, you know, reflect on is that this is not a historic issue, it's a current one. Uh, but he's also a wonderful illustration uh, of the fact that everybody um, in some way, um, I believe, can do something um, to increase the equality, um, not just of, of general humankind, but specifically for those in slavery. 
Uh, and so, there we go. Uh, so I always say to people when I first meet them under presentations like this, look, the issues of the magnitude that I'm talking about, 40.3 million people, you know, an issue that impacts our entire world. There is not a country exempt. You know, how on earth um, can we address an issue of that size and that magnitude? Uh, and I say, I say to that that what it requires is everybody first knowing that's key. There are a lot of people in our world to do today um, in New Zealand in Christchurch who have got absolutely no idea that there are more people in slavery um, today than any other time in our human history. So knowing something, but also if we um, as a as a, as a right, as humans um, could all come together and we're all willing to give what we have um, and the skills that we have um, and offer them to the cause, then we would collectively see real change. And an issue of that magnitude, it require, it, 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 there is no one solution that is going to solve it all. It's exceptionally complex in its nature. And if you're interested, um, please feel free to um, send me an email and I can talk with you more about what's actually causing and pushing and pulling and all these complex factors that are contributing to the numbers that I've shared. Um, it is very complex in its nature and it requires complex um, and different levels of intervention at different levels. Uh, so it requires governments, for example, to prioritise legislating and making these kinds of practices illegal, but also to resource um, their enforcement agencies to be able to identify and prosecute. Um, it requires organisations who are absolutely experts at um, development in communities um, and providing um, employment opportunities for women and children and seeing um, the growth in local economies so that people like Koa are no longer vulnerable um, to the lies of, of human traffickers and no longer um, they're susceptible to that kind of susception and to the offers and the hope that human traffickers um, present. Um, it requires a real um, addressing of, of global demand, um, which sadly does exist um, for um, the likes um, of a sexual industry. So, you know, we live in a world where back when you could travel, um, you know, people would travel from the developed world um, to developing countries for the pure purposes of, of having sex with minors um, or engaging in sex with minors. And so, um, you know, those kinds of trends um, drive the demand for children and for people to work in those industries to meet that demand. So as a very complex issue, uh, but I return to the point that if everybody offers the skills that they have, um, then we can address that complexity collectively. Um, so moving into um, what the organization I work for, what we're doing in this space, acknowledging we can't do it all, um, but working in an area that we are really experts in and that we're really passionate about. And I'll just read this um, this quote to you, um, which came from a funding proposal that someone, um, a colleague of mine prepared overseas for a, a funding grant. It says victims of both human trafficking and gender-based violence suffer severe emotional trauma. Um, as you can imagine from Hoa's story, hopefully um, that I shared. Research suggests some develop coping mechanisms, but many suffer without access to support, leading to severe depression and suicidal tendencies. Successful recovery is a long process as it takes time to trust staff, gain literacy, develop occupational skills and rebuild sustainable, respectful, trusting relationships that are vital for successful reintegration. And here is um, the most important line. Without adequate support, survivors are highly susceptible to further exploitation. And this is what Hagar essentially exists to do. We exist uh, in Cambodia, Afghanistan, and Vietnam to work with other organizations and government agencies that once they have found and located and received referrals from women like Hoa um, who have survived severe human rights abuse, um, like those covered under Sustainable Development Goal number five, um, they refer um, those survivors to Hagar, um, acknowledging that um, what they've been through is severely traumatic um, and that if they don't get the help that they need to address not just um, their current trauma and how that's manifesting in their life but also um, 
you know, how can we address the vulnerability that made them vulnerable to that treatment um, in the first place? Without that, they're likely or vulnerable to experience the same kind of abuse again. Um, and so I say to people, our, our elevator pitch uh, is to transform the lives um, of some of the world's most traumatized people. So Hagar is an expert agency at working with women and children who've suffered severe human rights abuse, the really nasty nitty gritty um, forms of abuse. Um, we're working with those kinds of survivors. Um, so our work really kind of takes two, um, has two focus points. Um, the first is very much working um, with the individual on that healing journey helping them overcome the trauma of their experiences so they can reintegrate into communities healed and thriving, but also that their vulnerability is addressed so they're no longer vulnerable to that kind of treatment. Um, and we do this through providing a holistic range of recovery services um, for the women and children that we receive the referrals for. Um, so really quickly powering through um, the service that we provide women and children who have um, been survivors. Uh, so we receive their referrals our caseworker will meet with them, um, evaluate what they kind of need, um, the depth of their trauma, what they need to overcome that trauma, and they'll create an individualized recovery plan. So that's one of the things that makes our organization really different in the sense that we don't run a standard six week recovery program, uh, you know, because we acknowledge that the nature and the trauma of the women and children that we're working with um, is different for every single woman. Um, and therefore, because everybody's experience is different, everybody's recovery needs to be different. So that initial caseworker recovery plan is really important to us. Um, and we provide a range of ongoing um, recovery services that all help in the realization of that recovery plan. So um, we organize, um, if not provide safe accommodation. So we don't have shelters um, in Cambodia and Vietnam. Uh, we do in Afghanistan, but in Cambodia and Vietnam, we um, have relationships with other organizations who are great at providing safe accommodation, but we also provide foster um, family placements. Um, and as you can imagine, for someone like Hawa, who hasn't felt safe in a really long time, um, feeling safe and secure is a really important part of someone's initial recovery journey. Um, so that's a number one priority always, is to make sure that someone has a safe place to stay, whether it be something we organize or with a family member. We provide expert trauma counseling. Uh, so our counselors are trained to be able to help our survivors unpack and process what has happened to them and develop um, strategies to cope going forward. We work with families um, to raise awareness within the family unit about the trauma that's been experienced. Um, and often explain to families that it's actually often not their, like the survivor's fault, you know, um, I don't have time to go into it, but there are real cultures of, of shame uh, that, you know, don't understand that when something happens to you, that's not necessarily your fault. And so working with families, and educating them is really important in terms of the holistic healing journey for that family member. Uh, we also provide legal support. Um, so this is a really important part of actually removing perpetrators from communities um, and addressing the issue at large. Uh, but we provide expert legal assistance for our survivors who do want to go through the court process and help um, in that journey. Um, and our coordination of testimony has led to the conviction of, of um, perpetrators in communities, which is awesome. Uh, but also we obviously, we want to address that vulnerability. We want to see women and children empowered and thriving in their future. Uh, so that like I said, um, like I said, they are no longer vulnerable, but also when they have kids, um, their future families are no longer vulnerable as well. That cycle of poverty, that cycle of trauma um, stops with our clients, um, which is where the real legacy of our work comes into play. So we organize educational opportunities for our, long, um, our younger clients, but also for our older clients. Um, you know, we work with other businesses um, in partnership to provide internship, job placement opportunities. We run job skill work, job skills workshops, but it's all about let's empower a, the, the women and children that we work with to be able to provide confidently for themselves in the future. Um, and after that, obviously, our, our ultimate goal is to see every single person that we work with reintegrated back into communities, um, healed whole, thriving, doing really well. 
um, and our mentality is that um, in all that we do is trauma informed. So we're always conscious and we're experts at helping people overcome the trauma of their experiences. But also um, our commitment is that we do whatever it takes for as long as it takes uh, to see transformation. So because of the nature of the women and children that we're working with, um, you know, we journey with them or we provide some kind of service for them for years and years. Some clients have been receiving services from us for 10 years and that's okay with us um, because we have that commitment to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes. Um, some are with us for one or two years. Um, that's because that's what they need. But yeah, whatever it takes for as long as it takes is our um, a real core value. So to return to Howard's story, uh, to put a bow on that, um, so by a series of miraculous events, uh, she ended up getting back to Vietnam. Um, Hagar received her referral um, when she was in hospital. Um, she was almost dead. Um, and so we received her referral um, to work with her. And so um, once she was um, physically ready, we began her recovery journey. Uh, we worked with her family to help um, provide practical assistance because remember her parents were unable to work. So we provided practical assistance both with regards to understanding some of Hoa's ongoing um, health conditions that were a result of her abuse, uh, but also to um, practically support them in a season as well, provided counseling for her, um, did the journey of healing. Uh, and ultimately last time I heard, um, she was doing a job placement in a hairdressing and nail studio um, and doing really well. So hopefully you can see through, through her experience that when she has kids, um, that she, the cycle of trauma will have stopped with her. Her future family will no longer be vulnerable. She's no longer vulnerable um, and she's able to live healed and whole despite the fact that she's survived that kind of experience. Um, and the reason that that story um, uh, I see stories regularly of women and children that we work with but the reason that that one sticks with me is because she is about my age and I just think sometimes to myself I think gosh you know um, if I had been in that circumstance uh, if my dad had been in a motorcycle accident if my mum had been sick if my sisters needed support then I absolutely would have gone and worked in a restaurant um, and if, if someone had offered me that job in Singapore, I would have gone. And it's by pure placement um, in the world um, and the development of our societies um, that we've had the very different lives that we've had. But it's a call in my heart to, to advocate for those like Hoa um, who haven't been as blessed as I have. Um, so that individual work, that transformation, um, healing, recovery with individuals is a massive part of Hagar's mission. Uh, but obviously, we also want to do what we can uh, to raise awareness um, about these issues to stop people's vulnerability, to, to educate people so they're no longer vulnerable or can identify the risks in their own communities. Uh, so we run um, workshops um, and any opportunities to really raise awareness in communities about these issues, about what human trafficking is, about what slavery is, about what your human rights are as a woman. Um, we are active in that space as well. So here are some photos of um, just some recent initiatives. Again, if you're interested, please email me and I will um, share with you more about this. But the photo on the left was taken in a Vietnamese high school. This is a competition we ran um, in coordination with some of our partners in this local high school to raise awareness about, about human rights. Um, and students had to creatively um, submit something that showed their understanding about what, the, what their rights were. Um, and they had hundreds of entries uh, so, you know, there's hundreds more Vietnamese um, children who have a better awareness of, of what their rights are. Um, on the right hand side here, this was something we did um, with men in the community, raising awareness about what um, their wives' rights were, about what the rights of women are um, and the responsibility of men in marriages. So those are just two very local um, examples of how, of how we've been involved, but also if you look at the Hagar Facebook page, you'll see more. Right, how am I going for time? So as I've said, um, we work, we're providing those recovery services with women and children um, in Cambodia, Vietnam, Afghanistan. So those are the countries where our staff are on the ground providing women um, the services working at their preventative level. 
Um, we also have some, um, a team in Singapore that are working um, with migrant workers in Singapore, um, and we're working to raise the capacity of other organizations to respond in Myanmar as well. But Cambodia, Vietnam, Afghanistan, those are the countries um, where the majority of our work and transformation is happening. Right, so um, what on earth then do I do here in Christchurch? Um, because we don't provide any kind of recovery services here in New Zealand. Um, and so my role really in, in, in Christchurch and the role of my, me and my other two colleagues at the Hagar New Zealand office um, is twofold really. Um, the first is uh, we exist here in New Zealand to raise awareness um, about those global issues that, that Hagar is tackling, which is why I come and do presentations like this with you all uh, so that you can um, learn about, you know, the fastest growing criminal industry in the world and that slavery exists. Um, so hopefully today you've all learned something um, and I can go away having done my job for the day. Um, and there are a lot of people in New Zealand who've got absolutely no idea that these issues exist. And that's no fault necessarily of their own. It's just um, the reality of our location at the bottom of the planet. and um, and yeah, some other factors as well. But I think that, yeah, we need to, our heart is to really raise awareness in the space about what's going on in our world and participate in it. Uh, and the second is that um, we work in New Zealand to, to raise financial support to pay for our programs overseas in Cambodia, Vietnam, Afghanistan. So um, obviously they are developing countries. They don't have the financial capacity to raise the kind of money that is needed to provide that ongoing holistic expert care that I've just described. Um, it takes a couple of thousand dollars each year per client to be US to be able to provide the services that we do. Um, hold on, drink moment. Um, and they just don't have the financial capacity to, to do that. So we exist here in New Zealand and in Australia and in the US. And we raise the money overseas, we raise the money here, and then we send it to overseas to essentially pay for the programs. So we say to our colleagues on the ground, you guys work with the women and children, you provide the recovery services, you raise awareness in communities about these issues um, to prevent um, and address vulnerability, and we'll raise the money here to pay for it. Um, and so that is a massive uh, big part of my job as well. Um, so I've already kind of bridged um, on the example that William Wilberforce is um, of an example of someone who, who made an incredible difference in this space. Um, but that was the, the call of his life. He dedicated the entirety of his professional life to it. And not all of us can actually do that. Uh, and I acknowledge that. Uh, but rather, I still genuinely believe um, that everybody uh, can do something. And so just wanting to touch into that now. Um, so at a Hagar level, um, we have wonderful volunteers who are such beautiful illustrations of the fact that everybody can do something um, on behalf of their, their, fellow, their fellow humans um, and essentially to, to crusade and, and to really um, advocate for, for equity. Um, so this story here, um, I'll just share with you. So the, the picture at the top left hand side of the screen, um, that is a painting um, done by a wonderful woman who heard about Hagar about 10 years ago. Um, and she was like, righto, um, you know, what can I do to participate in this? I can't go overseas and, um, you know, actually work with women and children. Um, and I'm not like William Wilberforce, uh, but what can I do? And she is um, an amazing artist, as you can see. She painted this painting. And so she decided that she uh, would create um, a, a, a charity um, and essentially all um, she sells artwork and she gives the profits from the artwork and from morning teas that she runs every now and again um, to Hagar. Um, and over 10 years, by simply selling paintings, which is something she loves to do, uh, she has um, essentially raised over $30,000 for our work, which is pretty darn cool. 
Uh, but not only has she raised thirty thousand dollars for our work by doing something that she loves and simply just offering that skill and talent, but she's also inspired others. So a couple of years ago, um, John, who was in the middle here, um, he heard about Hagar through Janie. Uh, they know each other. I can't remember how. Um, and he was like, hmm, I want to do a running fundraiser for Hagar. So he's a runner, mad on it, okay? And so he decided, all right, well, I'll challenge myself and I'll, ra I'll run five kilometers on the hour, every hour for 24 hours, okay? So every time the, the clock turned over, um, he went and ran 5Ks. Um, so I think, I think that equates to like 120 kilometers in total. Um, but he raised just by running and he got other people to come and run, run laps with him. He raised over $9,000 um, doing his incredible um, weekend adventure. Um, and he would never have heard about Hagar, I don't think. He might have, but we credit him hearing about Hagar to Janie. Um, but what's also really important is that um, John, um, he, like I said, invited people to come and run with him. And so I did a post on my Facebook page about this guy who's doing this crazy running fundraiser and did any of my friends and family want to go and do a 5k lap with him. And the guy at my church said, yeah, I'll go run a couple of laps with him. And so he went and ran with John throughout the night. Um, and they got to know each other and Brad heard about Hagar. Um, and Brad decided that he wanted, that he would do something for Hagar as well, um, having just captured a vision of what it is that we exist to do. And he essentially did a running fundraiser last year where he ran, he ran a personal best distance of 100 kilometers. Um, and he raised over $2,000 for Hagar, I think. But I use this example because it's an illustration of three people who have done what they love to both raise awareness about these issues. I can't calculate or even know how many people have heard about slavery or people like her because of the efforts of these three just doing stuff that they love and raising awareness by doing it. But um, between the three of them have raised, I've hazard probably about $45,000 just by doing stuff that they love. And I think that's a beautiful example of, of advocacy. And I really um, would urge you to think about what kinds of things do you love? What are hobbies? What are things that you already love to do? And also, what's on your heart? What are issues that really stir you as an individual? Pictures and stuff that you see on Facebook um, or stories that you see on Facebook or videos, you know, what is it that stirs your heart and that makes you upset that it exists in the world today? It may not be slavery that or trafficking. Um, that's, what, that's what mine is. But it may be animals or it may be um, cons yeah, conservation, women's rights, whatever it is. Um, there are so many things going on in our world today, but what is it that's on your heart and what are you good at? And can you potentially marry the two of them up and advocate um, from Christchurch and make a difference on a global issue? Because it does, it, the efforts of these three are an illustration of the fact that that does happen. The access and the equity that these guys have advocated for for through the through the innovative fundraising is significant, um, but also um, I wanted to just share briefly, checking at time, whoop, um, about the influence that your individual consumer choices have um, on our world today. Um, and World Vision actually just last week, in perfect time for this presentation. Um, have released a report which I really encourage you all to go away and read, essentially about imports coming into New Zealand um, and the likelihood of different imports and products have of, of being involved or of having slavery or forced labour in their supply chains. So going back to our 40.3 million fact, um, 24.9 million estimated are in some kind of forced labour. So that includes sexual slavery like power, but it also includes women and children who are in forced labor situations, some of them making products that we consume here in Christchurch. And we're creating the demand here um, that is encouraging that kind of practice internationally. Um, the World Vision Report found that um, 
the average New Zealand household, get this, spends about $34 a week on goods that are likely to have some kind of slavery or forced labor component in their supply chains. Um, so we are unknowingly here in New Zealand as a developed country through our imports and trades and consumer choices as individuals, we are unknowingly encouraging the slavery practice. Um, here is a quick screenshot of um, what I took from the report just for the sake of this presentation, but I again reiterate, please go away and read it. Um, and it highlights um, some of the top countries in which we are receiving goods from um, and the prevalence of forced and child labor in the products that we are importing. Um, so garments, for example, our importing of clothes is our number one import that, um, or, or the strongest, biggest risky good that we're importing in New Zealand. You see, for example, in China, um, we received $956 million in garments from China in 2019. And that's a known industry where forced labor exists. Um, so who knows what we're all wearing today um, and whether or not that has been involved um, in slavery. So I really encourage um, you all um, to not just think about what skills and talents have I got in my hand, what's on my heart to change, but also um, to pursue becoming conscious consumers. And this is something that every, like, that, uh, like I'm on a journey on personally, I am not perfect on, on this front by any means, but I'm committed to doing the journey and learning um, and doing my best to, to make decisions that I can be proud of. There's, a, there's a, um, a saying that every dollar that you spend is a vote for the kind of society that you want. Um, and I think that that can be quite a profound reminder for us. Um, so quickly, World Vision Risky Goods Research. It should be on their website. Um, if not, you can look, we, we posted a link about it, um, but also World Vision did. Have a look at what the top industries are for risky goods coming into New Zealand and um, how your decisions should be affected by that. But also with regards specifically to the garment industry, um, some of you may well have heard of Tefun's Ethical Fashion Guide, which essentially gives, um, it gives garments sellers here in New Zealand a score based on um, their knowledge of what's going on and the practices that are going on in their supply chains and how confident they can be that there's no slave labor happening in the production of the products that we buy. Um, so go and have a look at that report and see how your favorite uh, clothing suppliers score um, and have a look at that. Um, and really quickly, final thing, um, this is a current campaign going on at the moment, um, which is really very much linked to World Vision's risky good research, but also our conscious consumerism, um, in that New Zealand actually currently has no modern-day slavery act legislation, um, which essentially requires businesses to investigate what's going on in their supply chains. So there's no mandatory compulsion for businesses to know what's going on in their supply chains, and therefore... Um, it makes it really hard for us to make conscious consumeristic efforts that impact the demand overseas. Um, it's all linked. And I guess I would encourage you all um, to go and sign this current petition, um, which you can look at, sign for freedom at the bottom of the screen right here, which essentially is asking the government to pass some kind of modern day slavery act legislation, which would begin the process of requiring businesses to know what's going on in their supply chains and to actively address any kind of slavery or forced labor practices in those supply chains and report them back to consumers. So if this kind of legislation were to pass, that would make our job um, of conscious consumerism easier, but businesses aren't gonna do it if they don't think that there's any demand or desire for it from a consumeristic point of view. So I'd really encourage you all to go along and to sign that um, just as one immediate act you can do to help and the global issue as well. Um, and as I finish, here's a, here's a quote from, from William Wilberforce. And he says, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say that you did not know. Um, and so hopefully as I've flown through this big topic, you've captured a glimpse of actually, um, you know, here's a global prevalent issue that you've all learned a little bit about this afternoon, but also 
um, you know, our choices here in New Zealand in Christchurch, not just to advocate um, and to use our gifts and talents for issues we're, we're passionate about, but also our consumerist decisions actually can influence um, the equity and the treatment of women overseas and our role in it. Um, so yes, that's me very quickly. I acknowledge I've flown through that, um, but I do encourage you to get in touch if you have got any questions about it um, and fire any questions through that you may have. Thanks so much. I love the way you, you took it from the, the, the global picture into the work of Hagar and then back to down to some um, specific uh, things that we might do. Um, there was a quick question from, and I know we're sort of, some people might need to leave because we're on time, but um, question, is the evidence of trafficking to and slavery within New Zealand from Louisa? Yes. Um, so uh, again, if you look up, so last year, um, there was a guy called Joseph Manamata, um, and he was um, the first person prosecuted of human trafficking. Um, you can look up his story. He essentially had, he recruited people to come into New Zealand from Samoa. He had them working in the horticultural industry, um, working in a forced slavery situation by night for him, um, and he was convicted of, of slavery and trafficking. Um, so yes, we also know that um, historically in the likes of the horticulture and construction industries, there have been um, situations of, of forced labor, um, certainly underpaying. Uh, but I reiterate, I guess the key word is prevalent. Um, and it's not prevalent here. It is prevalent in Cambodia and Vietnam um, and people in, in Afghanistan. Um, so yes, but not, not to the same scale um, that our fellow humankind experience overseas, which is why our focus is very much over there at the moment. Great, thank you so much. And um, Fiona just uh, said it'd be great if you were happy to share your slides. So if you are, you can flick them to me, but um, see how you feel about that. Uh, of course, this has been recorded and I'm now uh, going to stop the